What's going on internet? IG here again today and we're going to be looking at the second video in the OpenSUSE 13.1 series that I've started. Of course if you haven't seen the introduction to this series or the first episode then links will be in the description below and also there should be in related videos next to the video on the right hand side. So let's move on to uh, what we're going to be tweaking in this GNOME desktop. It is running OpenSUSE 13.1 and I've got a few extensions enabled here but I want to get some more functionality out of it so that I can suit OpenSUSE to my more keyboard driven interface uh, and also for the times that I am using my mouse I don't want to be doing this whole stupid uh, up into the corner to get uh, to pull up my dock here and then go into the apps I love the idea of being able to go meta key and start typing what I want to launch uh, including uh, apps and music and stuff like that but I also want to be able to um, you know access this from a simple swipe to the side etc so when it comes to GNOME extensions, all you have to do is go to gnome.extensions.gnome.org uh, extensions and, uh, and enable the plugin that Firefox has uh, pre-installed uh, that will allow you to um, both access, install and enable these different GNOME extensions uh, in your desktop. So as you can see, if I go into Applications menu, for example, which will give me a nice Applications menu up here in the top left, all I have to do is switch that one to on and it will enable it in the top panel here as you can see. So I much prefer having a filtered menu there available for me. So I'm going to keep hold of that one. Now the other thing is that if you have already enabled these before and then you've since disabled them again, all you have to do is go into the GNOME Tweak tool and then you can see a list of extensions that you have enabled here. Uh, so all you have to do is toggle the ones to on that you want displayed in your, uh, in your GNOME shell interface. So for instance, dash to dock is one that I use to put the dock on the outside here, always visible, but it does auto hide when you bring a, vid uh, when you bring a window near it. I also have a weather indicator up here in on the top panel here and the calendar looks pretty decent as it is. I also have a Pomodoro timer here for productivity reasons and then also I've got the uh, most of the uh, volume controls, brightness controls, network and all that fun stuff that GNOME usually has. They also have an alternate tab interface that will uh, that shows the tab tool based on what is displaying in the window not just a simple icon so that's quite helpful. And I'm already starting to like the look and feel of this, uh, of this distribution a lot more than the default GNOME interface. So the next thing we need to talk about, at least for me, uh, is Microsoft Windows interoperability because uh, this is something that you know we all need to be able to access network drives that we have at work or uh, be able to uh, you know have decent compatibility when it comes to sharing office documents and stuff like that. Um, so the unofficial guide to OpenSUSE 13.1 has a great write-up on how you can enable these uh, these different options uh, through YAST. Uh, although they are using a KDE desktop, you can still do practically the same thing uh, in the GNOME desktop as well. Uh, so it includes uh, accessing Samba shares or sharing your files, sharing a folder on your computer to a Windows network and also right down to running uh, Windows applications in OpenSUSE including Wine or using Crossover or Play on Linux. So, of course, they do have links to pretty much everything else about the OpenSUSE desktop as well. So, it's a very useful guide. I will throw a link to this in the description below for those of you who want to check that out because it is quite a gem when you're first getting started with OpenSUSE and you need to know how to get stuff done. Now, when it comes to installing popular applications like Google Chrome and Skype that aren't open source, uh, all you have to do is search for them. Obviously, it's not that difficult. Uh, so, let's go to Skype, for example. If I want to download Skype, I go to the download Skype button on their website and it's pretty simple as far as choosing your distribution, which for me will be OpenSUSE 12.1 because that's about as close as I can get. I can then save that file and then open it. Now also it is important to check the dependencies for the application as uh, yeah, Skype has had issues with OpenSUSE in the past. But like I referenced in the previous video, there is a fantastic guide on the How to Forge website that, uh, that will help you get Skype up and running, especially on a 64-bit system. So we're just going to dash there really quickly, uh, just so I can show you what is important here as far as getting stuff done. So we go to the last page of the perfect desktop guide to OpenSUSE GNOME 13.1, and you can see here that all you have to do is download and install the Skype software file, the RPM file that you download. 
and that really should be all there is to it. There is also a very helpful uh, extension that you can get from the extensions website for GNOME Shell, which basically gives you better Skype integration so that you have a Skype icon up here in your top right hand corner. I've also included the media player indicator so that when I have a music player that is launched, I will get media controls up in the top right there as well, which is very, very helpful. Most of these things are things that most distributions are doing out of the box nowadays. And while it is a bit more effort with OpenSUSE, uh, at least you get control over what you're wanting to do and how you're wanting to do it. Now the only other thing that I wanted to cover in this video at this point was changing the default programs that are launched with particular file types. So if you go into Nautilus for example and you want to change the, uh, the default image viewer for example, you can go into image, open with and you've got a list of all the apps that are available there. Set whatever app you want as the default and then you will be opening that default application every time you open a JPEG. Now the only other thing that I did want to mention really quickly about my system specifically is that the color scheme that is a default or automatic in OpenSUSE isn't the best. Uh, really this is like an issue across all Linux distributions so it's worth checking out for your particular system, your particular monitor or your laptop screen to go and Google a color profile for that screen. Chances are one does exist. And essentially all this does is create a much more customized and a much more accurate representation of the colors that are on your screen. This is really important for people that are in graphic design or media that need accurate color representation. So as you can see, I just downloaded a simple ICM file, double clicked it, and that imported it into the library. I then go to the GNOME color uh, settings in the uh, GNOME settings here in the simple desktop settings. Don't go into the colors and then you can see here that I'm using a particular color profile here is the one that I downloaded. And if you view details you can get all of the actual specs and bits and pieces of uh, what this color profile actually does. So a very 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 useful setting and it makes a big difference when you're especially in the graphics department. Well that's all I really wanted to cover in this video. In the next video we're going to be taking a look at backing up your system and a few other system admin tasks such as updating and that sort of thing. So stick around and I will see you in the very next video. Uh, if you have any comments or suggestions feel free to go nuts in the comments section below or on Facebook, Twitter or Google Plus and I will see you in the very next video. So thank you for watching and I'll catch you later. Peace out ladies and gentlemen.